All right, welcome back. Uh, this is our next uh, lecture. It's going to be on evidence-based medicine. Uh, this can actually be really dry, so I'm really glad that um, you're joining us today. Uh, hopefully, this puts a whole bunch of literature in perspective and makes it so you don't have to read nearly as much. Um, I hope to make it really interesting, um, and I hope to make it hopefully practice changing. So the first question is, what is evidence-based medicine? So evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And then the practice is going to involve two things. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with, two, the best available external clinical evidence from systematic reviews. This is just the definition from actually the founder of evidence-based medicine, Sackett, and colleagues. Um, and this is from um, page 71 of, of a book that uh, we'll talk about in a second called How to Read a Paper. And basically, like I said, this, this definition boils down to two parts. One is your individual clinical expertise. This is everything you've gained in your training and that you continue to gain now that you're out of training. Um, I would say it particularly applies to your diagnosis and to your uh, joint decision making with patients. It's that art of practicing medicine. How do you do this? You practice medicine by um, sharing with patients and then seeing how they respond. And then the second part is not just getting information from your patients and sharing it with them. It's comparing that to all of the textbooks and from what other people have known through papers. Um, so this is the, the, the scientific part um, that you're combining then with kind of the art part. What are alternatives to evidence-based medicine? So if I don't think about this critically, I'll probably fall into one of these four categories, and that's anecdotal-based medicine. Um, this is if someone's ever told you, I, I had this patient once and I prescribed Prozac, and that patient um, tried to uh, kill themselves so now I'll never prescribe Prozac again. So this is based on a story that you either heard or that you've encountered yourself. Uh, this is obviously not the best way to practice because just because one patient had an adverse reaction from a medication doesn't mean that medication should go into the bad box. That doesn't mean we shouldn't use it ever again. Another type of medicine, this is a very popular type, is called eminence-based medicine. Uh, Eminence-based medicine is really popular because it's kind of the way medicine was practiced back in the day. This is my attending or my boss told me to do it. Uh, my boss knows best and so I will trust everything they say and that's how I'm going to practice medicine, how, how other people have told me to practice. And this, this lives on today. You know, there are certain experts in their fields that I still follow on um, their training guidelines. This isn't necessarily bad but it's important to put it into context and to say, you know what I'm doing right now? I'm practicing according to someone else and it's not based on the fact that I've looked at the evidence myself, which is probably what I should do. Litigation-based medicine, you see this a lot more in kind of large government entities. They do everything to just prevent being sued. So every clinical decision you make isn't necessarily for the best of the patient, it's just the safest decision so that no one gets mad at you, so that no one ever sues you. And an, another alternative that I really enjoy is novel-based medicine. This is if I've read one paper that says one medicine is really good, then I start using that medicine nonstop. Um, but of course, another paper is going to come out and it's going to say that that medicine is no good, in which case I'll stop it and then I'll be on to the next paper with the next new medicine. And so then you find yourself in the cycle thinking that you found this silver bullet but never actually finding it. And this is um, what this quote is about down here. Good news, your cholesterol has stayed the same, but the research findings have changed. So, and this is actually true. We, we used to treat cholesterol based on a number, but now we treat it based on a, on a risk, risk calculation score. And so this really does happen in medicine. So I want to start um, with a word from Darth EBM. Um, this is actually from a doctor called Z-Dog. Uh, he plays this character called Darth EBM. I find his podcast very funny. He says, you don't know the power of evidence-based medicine. So that's the, really the purpose of this, is to teach you the power of evidence-based medicine. 
And this is really a more clear example. So why is evidence-based medicine important? Well, we can look back in time and see ways in which we haven't listened to the medicine and the evidence-based. Um, so the first is bloodletting. That actually happened from 500 BC to about 1910. And bloodletting was actually found to be harmful around the year 1820. Um, around there, a doctor actually probably did one of the first randomized controlled trials, and he said, you find a patient that you've bloodletted, and I'll take a patient, one of my patients, and I won't bloodlet them, and we'll see which patient fares better. Um, we'll cast lots to decide whose patient is whose patient, so it was even kind of a randomized uh, controlled trial. And so we kind of started knowing it about that time, and yet it persisted for another about 100 years after that. The second thing is bed rest for acute back pain. I'll still hear doctors today saying that if you have back pain or a back strain that you should just rest it, rest until it goes away. And we've known since about 19, um, late 1900s uh, that bed rest wasn't good. And so we're still doing this 20, 30, 40 years later, and it's not a good practice. Benzos is non-addictive alternatives. Uh, this was found true in about the 1970s, and uh, it doesn't persist as much anymore. But you will still, uh, still see a lot of family doctors prescribing um, benzodiazepines for insomnia and anxiety very regularly. I've seen people on up to three benzodiazepines. Uh, so you, you definitely still see people practicing this way, even though we've known for quite some time now, for 40, 50 years, that this is actually not a beneficial practice. What are we going to cover? So first, um, we're going to introduce evidence-based medicine and find some helpful resources. Next, we're going to look at levels of evidence and types of studies. After that, psychiatric scales. This will be the first hour, is these first three bullet points. The second hour will be statistics, how to read a paper, and how to apply evidence-based medicine. Um, so this is where we're going to be going, and let's go there. Introduction to evidence-based medicine and helpful resources. So I basically created this to show you how I go about finding articles and researching things so that you have a framework that you, then you can create and kind of modify for yourself. So first, I just try to keep everything organized. So back in the olden days, everyone had filing cabinets and bookshelves. I don't really have any of that anymore because everything's digital. Um, so what I have is very organized books on my computer. So you can see I have my psychiatry folder, I have my books folder, and then within that books folder, I have all these different topics in psychiatry. Here's my evidence-based medicine folder. And here's all the books that I have on evidence-based medicine. So you just want to kind of keep this updated, keep it up to speed so that you know exactly what's going on. Um, next, besides books, though, of course, you need articles. Uh, unfortunately, you know, here at, at TheraCare, we're not a part of any large academic institutions. So we're going to have to go onto Google Scholar and, and really to look for um, articles that way. You know, the funny thing is, is even when I, even though I'm a part of a large uh, academic medical center right now, I, I do have access at the VA as well as um, Loma Linda University. I still actually turn to Google Scholar most of the time because uh, my access at those places is linked to Google Scholar, and so I'll still be able to find those articles without having to pay anything. Um, but if you, so, so if you have that linkage, it's really helpful. If not, um, you just kind of have to go on Google Scholar and find it. Now what do I do with those articles after? So typically when I find an article and I download it, it, it will download into a format like percentage, lowercase a, uppercase z, and then this really long string of, of, of letters and numbers. And you know I'm not going to want to type all that up in, into the APA format with the author year, retype the entire article. So what I would uh, suggest that you do is you download a free application called Zotero. This is very common in, in the PhD world. My, my wife is actually the one that introduced me to this, in addition to um, another uh, psychiatry resident um, when he was in training. And basically, you just take that PDF and you drop it right here into your folders that you've created. And then it will pull in all the metadata. So I didn't type any of this up. It pulls this all in, it has the author name, it has the entire abstract, 
it has the publication, it has the year, and actually you can even turn these folders and it'll automatically generate like citation lists for you and things like that. So it really, really simplifies things and it's a really nice way to keep all of your articles organized. Once you put your articles in here, uh, you can delete them because this program then has saved and stored all of your articles in another place on your computer. If you ever need to retrieve that article um, in order to you know, talk about it to someone or send it to someone, then you would just uh, drag the PDF from here because you have to open the actual files. This just shows the metadata when you're clicking on this button. It's just showing the metadata. It's not showing the actual PDF. So you click on the little arrow, a drop down appears, you drag that onto your desktop or to a different location and, and now it's there again. And you can do that as many times as you need to. So now you have all of your articles stored digitally, but the problem is, is how do you then um, read them? Because uh, reading articles digitally, I, I think, is kind of lame. I, I know really two ways. One is with this device, this is what I use, is the Remarkable. The other way would be with like maybe a Kindle. I don't know if, if you can actually put a PDFs on a Kindle, but maybe that's possible. But certainly you can with an iPad. Um, but I really like this Remarkable. The Remarkable 2 just came out. This device is about $500, so it is an investment. But I have probably like 500 articles on it. And so I essentially can carry around my entire library, um, which is stored on a cloud, so I can access my library from anywhere. And I just drag the article um, from Zotero that I, that I downloaded. I drag it directly into the Remarkable cloud and then it syncs with my pad. You can write on this pad with your stylist. It's the most paper-like experience you can, you can find. And then that, that writing actually gets uploaded to the cloud and then you can read it at a later time. Um, if you're interested in this, feel free to contact me and I can show you kind of what it looks like. Uh, maybe in future talks I'll even use this in order to generate a screen that we can just kind of follow along and write along together because it will actually mirror your screen as well. Um, here's a couple book recommendations for evidence-based medicine specifically. These are the books that I read in, in preparation for this um, talk. How to Read a Paper, 5th Edition, very good book. Um, User Guide to Medical Literature, this is an article by JAMA. And then if you really want scales, I've only actually read about half this book so far. Clinical Rating Scales and Assessments in, Psychi in Psychiatry and Mental Health. There's a couple other scale books, but this is the one that I found most helpful if you want kind of a crash course into psychiatric scales. Very in-depth, very scientific, very good. Here's some other resources that I found very helpful along the way. These are resources really for um, clinical organizations. So Psychiatry Online, a, a great resource with a ton of handouts for both patients and their families. Uh, you can also buy ebooks on this. Um, all the psychiatry kind of big textbooks are on this. And if you're a part of it. This is affiliated with the APA, so the American Psychiatric Association. So it has all the APA kind of textbooks on it as well. Uh, Psychopharm uh, Mobile Algorithm. This is an algorithm that was created by Harvard um, and some of their uh, staff over there. There's research papers for every single algorithm that have been published. It's a good um, fallback if you want a, a quick and easy way to approach depression, mania, anxiety. Uh, psychopharmacologically, it'll, it'll give you the high points and it'll tell you, all right, you tried an SSRI, what should I do next? And it'll give you that kind of information. So a great website there. You also have a mobile version. This is the, the link to the mobile version. ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, a good website with a lot of good addiction resources. NEI Global, this is by Dr. Stephen Stahl. Um, it, with a subscription to this, which I have, you get a mobile app, which is essentially the Stahl's Prescriber Guide. This is what I use for my prescription for patients in order to start medicines. What dose do I start at? What medicine do I go up at? It's a mobile app, so it's easily searchable. I can carry it everywhere. I can have it at all times of day. And then in addition, they have a bunch of videos with the most up-to-date research on various psychopharmacologic topics. They also have a couple symposiums that happen every year. Uh, and an NEI Congress, and so they have a wealth of information in addition to a journal called um, CNS Spectrums, um, which I think, I think Dr. Stahl is the editor of that. Cochrane Library, the first systematic review database, always a good place to look. The Clinical TMS Society, for anyone that's interested in TMS, they have a 
bunch of really good resources here. It also connects you with a bunch of people that are um, interested in TMS, and so it's really easy to make a bunch of professional connections through this website. Mocha Test, uh, when it was free, I used to go here a little more. I mean, it is still free, but now they require you to pay a fee in order to use their services, um, but you can still go there. Uh, a APPI, I can't remember that one, to be honest. NICE, this is the European guidelines that are kind of in line with the FDA. So if you want to know what the UK says you should do next and what medicines are on label and off label for certain psychiatric conditions, these NICE guidelines will have that. CEBM, another great resource. And then clinical evidence by the, um, I think this is another British website. So then how should I approach all of these websites and all of this information now that I kind of know about it? Well, I, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you can go about it. Um, first, I would probably look at textbooks because they have synthesized everything kind of on the largest scale and you're relying on this author's um, biggest kind of knowledge. I would check out NEI, they have a podcast in addition to their mobile application, maybe invest in a subscription uh, for a year just to watch some of their videos. Uh, there's these 100 foundational journal articles, this has a hyperlink and when you have this presentation uh, downloaded you can click on it and it'll give you all the uh, suggested recommended first readings in your journey into journal articles for psychiatry specifically. The, foundational journal calls of psychiatry spanning from like 1950 up to present time. And then systematic reviews. These are going to give you the biggest overall global picture of what's going on in psychiatry. And in general, they're going to be the highest level of evidence. This finishes our first point. We just learned about evidence-based medicine and hopefully these resources have helped you. If you have any questions on where to go first or maybe how to organize this, feel free to reach out. Next is levels of evidence and types of studies. So what kind of types of evidence do we have? What kind of types of studies do we have? Well, we have this great pyramid to kind of help us out. So this is hierarchies of evidence. And then at the top here, we have the systematic review. So this is going to have the least amount of bias, and this is going to be the most generalizable, and it's going to apply to the most biggest group of people. So wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to read a single paper that applies to almost every patient I see that's not going to be affected or tainted in some way. So that's why systematic reviews are at the top. Now interesting, I kind of want to skip to the bottom here, expert opinion is actually at the bottom, even lower than a single case study. So if I see a single patient and I write up that uh, report and I say, this is what happened to this patient, isn't that interesting? And it takes me like a day. That is actually better than a whole group of experts coming together, sitting on a panel, um, robed in, in all of their splendor, and then um, uh, providing their edict. So this is actually really interesting. It's important to remember that expert opinion is always lower than any other form of evidence um, because even experts are prone to bias. Below a systematic review is randomized controlled trials. Below that is a controlled cohort, uncontrolled cohort, case studies, case series. Now, what does all this mean? This is actually going to be the outline of what we're going to be going over during this section. And we're just going to look at what each of these types of studies are and when we use them. Um, the first question, though, is what kind of study should we use? And this is an interesting question because I, in medical school, I know what we learned is if, if there was a test question and it said, you have to pick between which is the best type of study, which type of study would you use? The answer is always randomized control trial. Randomized control trial is always the best kind of study. It doesn't really matter. But actually, that's not true. Randomized controlled trials is really the best study when you're trying to look at one treatment versus another treatment. So which is the better treatment? Prozac or a sugar pill? The way you're going to answer that study question is by conducting a randomized control trial by assigning some people to a placebo, by assigning some people to Prozac, and then by comparing how those two groups do to each other. And of course you're going to try to make both those two groups about the same in all of their demographics and their diversity and the level of sickness and, and everything in order to compare those. 
So in that case, the randomized control trial is the best. But if you're asking the question, what's the best study for, let's say, a new diagnostic tool, like an MRI, you know, do, does, a, does a brain scan work to detect depression? Um, or does the scale that I just created work to detect depression? The randomized control trial is not a good study to answer that study question. Um, the best study to answer that question is a cross-sectional or longitudinal survey. Or let's, let's say you want to get a cause. Um, uh, does, um, does Prozac cause depression? The, the best way to answer that is not going to be a randomized controlled study. The best way to answer that question is with a cohort study or even a case control or even case report. So basically anything but a randomized controlled trial. Randomized controlled trials can never get it caused. And this is a really important point to remember is the limitations and the benefits of each type of study. So if the researchers have said, we just created a new study, it, it, is, it is asking the question, what causes depression? It's a wonderful, it has wonderful methods. And then you look at the top and it says it's a randomized controlled trial. You just skip that paper and you go on to something else because that paper is not going to really give you the information that you need because a randomized controlled trial isn't even the right way to go about answering that question. And so it's important to remember this. What's the study question asking and what kind of study should be mapped onto that question? Here's some general, just taking a step back from, from that, which, which studies are answering which type of questions is what we just talked about. To, to talk about this next section, these are five questions to ask about every study. Um, does the study add anything? So the first thing I do is I, I read the abstract. If the abstract says, Prozac helps treat depression, I say, why do I need to read this? I already know Prozac treats depression. I already know how much it treats depression. I already know its side effects. So why would I need to read this article at all? So if there's no reason for me to read the article, I just skip it. I go to the next article. Um, if it's interesting, and they, it says something like, Prozac increases the risk of suicide by 1%, then I say, oh, interesting. Hmm. The next question I, I would ask is, what are the methods? And when I'm asked this question, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, OK, Prozac increases the risk of suicide by 1%. What kind of population is this? Maybe all they used in the study is an inpatient psychiatric population. Well, that's not the population I treat. I treat outpatient. So already, the results of this study aren't really going to be applied to me. And I might already decide to skip it, even if it has this kind of interesting tidbit attached to it. Or maybe, maybe, the, um, maybe the population is all people with um, uh, drugs or alcohol use. Or maybe they're all in the uh, depressed phase of a bipolar 1 illness. Well, now I already know the answer. I mean, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't use SSRIs in the depressed phase of bipolar illness. So, so it, it really depends on what my patients are like and what the study population is like and if there's any connection at all between those. Um, for some reason, psychiatry has a lot of studies from Finnish or, or like Norwegian populations. And so we always have to answer, ask the question of ourselves, OK, this Finnish study is amazing. It, it has tons and tons of data points. but is the population of Finland anything like the population of Southern California? And this is a question that I've wrestled with time and time again. And so I kind of have to take some of these studies with a grain of salt, even though they're incredible studies, just because I don't think the Southern California Brea population is the same as Finland. I don't see a bunch of tall Norwegians walking around Brea, for example. Um, what treatment? Um, was considered and what was it compared with. So is this an adequate comparison? Um, if you're comparing therapy, active therapy, to a wait list, is that a good comparison? Is a wait list a really good placebo for comparing that to therapy? Um, or is comparing a ketamine to a saline infusion the same? Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. It's going to make me kind of go bonkers. I don't think comparing it to a non-psychoactively substance is going to be very effective because the people, it's not really true blinding. The people that get ketamine are going to be tripping. The people that don't get ketamine aren't going to be tripping. They're going to be like, where's the ketamine? What's going on here? And they're going to know they weren't treated. And the fact that you know you're being treated, it makes that treatment more effective. And that's the purpose of blinding. So we need to make sure that, that, that the placebo and the treatment are actually the same. 
The next is if, if the bias is eliminated, if the methods are good, the next question is, was the treatment significant? Um, and this just means, did the treatment separate from placebo? Or is the placebo identical? If that question is answered yes, then the question is, is how big of a difference is there between placebo and? So you can have significant results, and we'll get into more into this later, um, but those significant results might actually not make any real world change. And that real world change is really what effect size measures. Now going through kind of each of these studies turn by turn, starting with a systematic review and going down to um, case controls and case series. So what is a systematic review? Essentially, this is a systematic review in pictorial form. You start with a bunch of little studies. Those all get churned into the machine, machine and then out comes this beautiful organization of data, all the studies packaged together with a nice big sweeping conclusion. So that's what a systematic review is. There's advantages to this, and we have to also remember that there's disadvantage. So the advantage is it's easy to interpret uh, because you're taking a lot of data. They're doing all the work for you. They're doing all the heavy lifting. They're sorting through that data, finding all the little triangles, all the things they want to compare, and then coming up with a pretty big global conclusion. There's a small bias. Um, you can combine data to show an effect where one was not seen initially, and it helps resolve. So it helps resolve contradictory findings. So let's say one study says SSRIs cause more harm than good, and another study says SSRIs cause more good than harm. You go, oh my goodness, one of these studies says that I should use SSRIs, another one of these studies say I shouldn't use SSRIs, what should I do? That's when you look for a systematic review and you find out what's doing the most for the most amount of people. So that's a very, very helpful part of the systematic review. The disadvantages, um, and there's a saying that we say is garbage in leads to garbage out. So it replicates or magnifies flaws of the smaller studies. Um, and then the methods can be kind of long-winded. They're, they're, they're kind of a bear to read sometimes, these, these systematic reviews in the methods section. They do all summarize um, their methods. Uh, so there's a summary kind of at the end, so you can always just kind of flip to that and you don't have to go through that, that entire long method section. So yeah, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. So let's say I had a bunch of small studies and they're all underpowered and they all have huge amounts of bias in them and then I combine all those studies together, there's going to be even more bias in the systematic review. It's become an even worse study than the bad studies were because you're just creating one giant bad study. And this even just recently happened. I was on up to date even about a year ago, and, and they said antipsychotics don't work on. Um, this is a, up to date is a large, um, well respected medical, online medical um, site uh, that costs a decent amount of money. Um, and I was on there and, and the section on delirium said delirium no longer works and this was was based on one systematic review that was very recent that basically took a bunch of studies they they cherry-picked the studies that said uh, medications don't work on delirium and they put all those studies together of course what's the systematic review gonna say the systematic review is gonna say oh this uh, uh, you can't treat delirium but it's ignoring this whole other body of literature that says that uh, antipsychotics and treatment does work for delirium. And so that's the problem. And in a lot of these studies, their, their controls were antipsychotic. So they're controlling antipsychotic versus antipsychotic. So there was no actual control in, 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 in that case as well. And, and so that's a disadvantage of the systematic review. Um, here's some questions to ask of the, any systematic review. What was the clinical question? What was the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the various studies that they, that they included? How were the individual studies weighted? So you know you can weight studies differently. They could emphasize one study that maybe had more questionable findings and they could weigh that higher than um, another study that has better findings. So you wanna kinda know that. How important are the results? Does this have anything to do with my patient population? And then how can this be applied in the real world? Here's an example of the usefulness of a systematic review. So what we have here is we have, um, this is a study, let me go down here. This is a study that's showing the, effect, the effectiveness of, of cognitive behavioral therapy um, and the discontinuation uh, uh, with compared with no active treatment. So which one's better for, for treating depression? Um, no active treatment or cognitive behavioral therapy? 
And what's interesting is you look at this study from Blackburn in 1986, this is a line of no effect. So this says CBT does nothing. This is two, it, so if the line of no effect, if, if anything crosses one here with an odds ratio of one, that by definition means this, that, that, that you can't say that, that CBT is more effective. So CBT is not more effective, Dobson CBT is not more effective, Evan CBT is not more effective, Holland, oh, it was almost more effective, but it's still not more effective. Jarrett, not more effective. Uh, Kovacs, uh, not more effective. Shea, not more effective. Simmons. What this is, is this is the pooled data from all of these above studies. So all of these studies showed no effect, but when you took all the data together, you actually see that CBT works between maybe two, maybe even up to five times but definitely between two and five times better than no treatment in treating depression. And so just saying that a study has no effect isn't actually enough because uh, the term no effect, like in the case of Blackburn or Dobson, that CBT has no effect, could actually mean I just need to get more data. I need to get more data points in order to support my hypothesis because I'm just not seeing a difference even though something exists. And we'll talk about type one and type two error later, but this is essentially um, uh, one of those types of error. So that's the power of the systematic review, being able to pool data so that you actually see things when it seems from all these separate studies that nothing's actually happening. Resolves those contradictory findings. Um, another, this is kind of an aside, but when you're thinking of systematic reviews, you want everything to be homogeneous, so you want your all your studies to be similar. And this is because, like, let's say, you know, I, I, I'm trying to compare five apples. Um, uh, five apples, I mean, this is just a fact. So just think about this. For, this is kind of weird, but just think about this. Five apples and four oranges makes five apples and four oranges, not nine apples and oranges. Because if I say nine apples and oranges, it could be one apple, it could be two. The rest are going to be oranges. So you really want to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. You don't want to lump two different things together and then say, look, there's nine of them, because then that's going to kind of muddy the waters. And there's a way that we can statistically measure this, and it's called chi squared, um, chi squared, um, which measures whether the study is heterogeneous or not, um, whether they made this error, the nine apples and oranges. And if the chi-square equals is, is excuse me is greater than the number of studies included, then the studies are heterogeneous. So let's say that there is ten studies in something, and the chi-squared was a hundred, then um, that you just throw that you don't even read that paper because they're going to come up with this as the conclusion. Look, you have nine apples and oranges, and it's just comparing different things. So that's it for systematic review. And the only reason why I included this uh, key squared part is just so you know, this is in papers, and I want you to just be familiar with that term and to know what that term is measuring and to know when to throw out a paper. What is a randomized controlled trial? So in a randomized controlled trial, you start with the disease, and then you look forward in treatment. The advantage is, is it's free from bias because bias is controlled at each step, and it's good for studying treatment efficacy. Here's four types of bias, so what am I trying to, to limit? You have selection bias, performance bias, exclusion bias, and uh, detection bias. Uh, publication bias is kind of another form of bias, and publication bias isn't included here, but that just means only positive studies that show differences get published, or maybe, uh, like in the case of that delirium example that, that I said, you know, that, the, the shocking, oh my goodness, our medications don't do anything for delirium, then that gets published. So basically you get a whole bunch of studies that say things do things when they probably don't. Um, because when you say something is going to do something, like Prozac is effective, Prozac is effective, that gets published over and over and over and over again. But then the negative studies that say that Prozac does nothing don't really get published because there's no, no one wants to publish something that says nothing's happening even though it's important to, to publish that as well. Um, and each of these shows you the type of bias happens that's happening at each stage. So it's selection bias. You have um, systematic differences in the comparison group attributed to incomplete randomization. So your control and, 
and intervention groups. So if I took if I took a whole bunch of people that were, let's say, socioeconomically very well off, and a whole bunch of people that were socioeconomically um, not very well off, and my control group was the people that were not well off, and my uh, treatment group was the was the group of people that were well off. Well, these groups are already different, so I've already failed, and it's already tainted my results because maybe their differences in depression is just because some people don't have any money. It doesn't have anything to do with Prozac not working or working. It has to do with money, and so um, or being well off or not being in a crime-ridden area, and so that's why selection bias is really important. Performance bias, uh, this is that the control and intervention groups are treated differently once they're enrolled. So this is when the um, doctor that is performing the study really wants a result. And so they're really invested in the treatment group um, uh, because that group is the one that they want to see do the best. And so this would be due to, this is solved just by doing a double-blinded study, right, so that the so that the person that's conducting the study doesn't try to push some people into health and other people into illness. Exclusion bias is control and intervention groups have different dropout rates. So, uh, you know, I start with groups, maybe they're both the same, but then for some reason, my intervention groups, and this is actually a very common form of bias that happens in studies, they get depleted. So there's tons and tons and tons of dropouts. Usually it's probably because of adverse side effects, right? And then what they do is, is studies will enrich their population, so they'll take those dropouts and they'll say, you know what, we lost 50% of our study, but let's just pretend that we didn't, and we'll turn that back into 100%. And now this treatment group looks really effective because it really treated effectively, let's say, half of that 50%. So now it looks like that treatment works on half of all the people, but you also lost half your population. So that's called enrichment, and that happens a lot in studies. And um, we need to make sure that the dropout rate between our control and our intervention group is always about the same. Uh, the last one is detection bias. Control and intervention group were assessed um, differently. Um, and outcome of a, okay, so I give my control group, like let's say a PHQ-9, and I give my intervention group a MODRES. These are two different depression scales. That's not okay, because the MODRES doesn't clearly map onto the PHQ-9. So I need, to, I need to have the same sort of outcome with each group. There are disadvantages of the randomized controlled trial. First of all, it's unethical to conduct a treatment that's already shown superior. So if I know that Prozac prevents suicide, I can't conduct a study that says, does Prozac really prevent suicide? Um, because now I'm letting people die and I'm withholding treatment from them when they could be held by Prozac. Um, the other thing is a randomized controlled trials can be very expensive. They take a long time. They're, they're the least generalizable. So they're really just asking, you know, here's a group, here's a group, here's one difference between them. Let's see how it, that one difference does. And we know, you know, I mean, between me and another person that looks exactly like me, that comes from the same background, that comes from the same culture, we're going to have a myriad of differences in common. And so it's, it's, it, 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 it's sometimes not generalizable to, 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 the, to the broader population. Um, it's not necessarily uh, free from bias, and you need to check it. So just because something says randomized controlled trial doesn't mean that it doesn't have any of these types of bias. These are something we need to be actively thinking about on our own. Um, what do I make of non-randomized controlled trials? It's kind of bad news, bad news. So all non-randomized controlled trials will have some form of bias. The question is, is how much does this bias really affect their, their final results? Um, and it really almost always affects the conclusion, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should throw a study out, right? These cohort studies are very good, even though there's bias involved. That's a perfect segue to cohort studies. So um, with a cohort study, remember we're trying to get at the question, what causes what? So we're trying to get a cause. So in this kind of study, you start with exposure, and then you look forward. In the case of a prospective study, this is this type of study, that's a cohort study, a prospective cohort study, or backward, a retrospective study, at disease development. And it helps determine the disease cause. The largest and um, best ever cohort study 
is actually a cohort study that was started, I think, in the 1950s, uh, maybe a little earlier. And, and what they did was they took one group of doctors. It was a, um, a prospective cohort study. They took one group of doctors that smoked, one group of doctors that didn't smoke, and they looked forward in time. They followed them for like 30 years, um, 40 years. It might actually still be ongoing. I have to look that up. And um, they found out that smoking was bad for your health. And they found this out because doctors have in no dropout rates. So all the doctors followed up, and the doctors that smoked started getting more and more cancer, more and more lung disease. And they said, look, it really does this. And so we can see how powerful a cohort study is. This is we wouldn't know that smoking is, is, is related to bad health consequences if it wasn't for a study like this. A case control study is, is similar. It starts with the disease. Um, and then it, and then you match the disease to the control, and you look back for exposure. It determines association but not causation. Sometimes it, it's kind of nebulous here. Sometimes it does help with with causation. Um, although strictly speaking, it doesn't, which is kind of interesting with this kind of Roundup case. I don't know if anyone's read about this, but Roundup was just sued um, successfully in a class action lawsuit. By people with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and and basically they took all these people with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they all saw um, that they were all exposed to Roundup and not as exposed to other things, and as a result, uh, they said that Roundup was implicated in this, and so that happened legally, and and legally they said it was a legal cause, which again is kind of questionable, but sometimes it's your only option is to do these kind of case controls things if you can't look forward and back in time in a cohort type of fashion. Uh, next would be a cross-sectional survey. I don't really have a great example for this. They're, they're a little less common, but essentially it's just asking about prevalence. So for example, you know, how, how much depression is in a population? That would be a cross-sectional survey. Or the reason I put these normograms here is how tall is the average three-year-old, right? So if I if I look at a you know three, here's three. This is months actually. Let's say three-month-old. So here's a three-month-old, and then you go down, and then here's the the length in inches. The average three-year-old is about 24 inches. So this is just prevalence. They've taken all the three three-month-olds, and they've weighed them all, and they put them on a chart to show you um, the bell-shaped curve and and, and that's all a cross-sectional study is. is it, it essentially answers the question, how frequent is this condition in the population? Case report and case series, these often get misjudged, but they're actually really, really important. They alert us to amazing breakthroughs in treatment, and they also alert us to amazing problems with treatments. And the classic example of a, of a case report that did this was the case report with thalidomide, um, where it was based on um, two studies. One doctor saw um, two babies that had been exposed to thalidomide in utero, and it gave them this flipper-like um, change in their, in their hands, and you can even see the bones are not formed correctly. And this identified the entire, this, this, this helped the entire medical community identify that thalidomide was causing these teratogenic problems. And so this really prevented more damage very quickly because you can turn these out in a couple days or a week and, and alert people very quickly. So in conclusion, we looked at systematic reviews, we looked at randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, cross-sectional surveys, and case report and case series. Systematic reviews take a lot of data, they put it all together. You always want to make sure that the data that they put in though was good, otherwise you're going to get junk in, junk out. Randomized control trial, you're looking at treatment between a control and um, uh, intervention. Uh, it's minimizing those four, maybe five types of bias. And it's, it, it's not going to be very generalizable like a systematic review, but it's going to give you the information on a smaller level with the least amount of bias that you want. Cohort study, uh, you can either look forward in time and see what happens to people and, and see what kind of diseases they develop, or you can look backward in time, starting with the disease and, and tracing back from exposure. A cross-sectional survey, looking at essentially um, prevalence, and then case report or case series. A case series is just uh, two patients 
or three patients instead of a case report where it's one patient. These can be written very quickly and they can identify serious benefits of treatment or serious risks of treatment. This finishes our second point in, in, in our talk, so now we can go to the third point into psychiatric scales. Um, first, I, I don't really practice pediatric scales, but I just put this in for people that are interested in the pediatric population. And there are universal scales, the biggest of which is the KSADS. This, this um, uh, takes hours to administer, but it provides you with a wealth of information. Here are some other global scales that, that can give you a variety of conditions that they're basically screening for. Anxiety, I've used a scared scale very often. This has a bunch of different um, anxiety disorders that they try to differentiate. Um, ADHD, of course, Connor, SNAP, SNAP4, um, Vanderbilt. Uh, PTSD, UCLA index is a good one. Depression, childhood depression inventory. Mania, youth mania rating scale. I really don't like this scale, but we don't have a lot. Or um, bipolar disorder rating scale, another really not good scale. Weimers is probably better than the BDRS. A trauma, of course, the ACEs, and then autism, there's the ADOS is kind of a classic example of that. More important is, is adult scales, I would say. I mean, this is where I where I'm more practice. So I, I basically screen everyone in my clinic with at least a GAD7 for generalized anxiety disorder um, and depression with a PHQ-9. Uh, it then kind of varies from there. I'll, I'll often use the ASRS because ADHD gets um, undetected a lot of the time. Sometimes I'll do a YBOC if if my suspicion for OCD is is very high. Um, a really good uh, screener for OCD is also the OCD-I, the OCD inventory. It's a shorter scale. The YBOC can take a little while um, for you to complete and kind of to explain to the patient. Uh, psychosis, brief psychosis rating scale is a good one. Stop bang. Sexual function, really important when we're prescribing SSRIs to get a baseline sexual function because patients with depression also have poor sexual function. So when I treat them, I want to see if, if their sexual function is getting worse or better. Um, the Arizona Sexual Experience Scale is a, is a very good scale for that. For borderline, there's the Zanarini. For delirium, there's these options. Um, but I would refer back to my, my previous talk um, for more detailed um, information on, on delirium. Now the question is, um, uh, in medicine, I tend to be not trusting of things. Just because you say you have the scale of the GAD7 and this detects generalized anxiety disorder, it makes me wonder, do we really trust to it? And this is a whole science in and of itself. It gets very complicated. I, I don't know it myself, to be perfectly honest. Um, but here is just kind of some highlights. Uh, first is, is that uh, any scale has a reliability, which is also known as precision. That's probably the, the name that we know best. And any scale also has a validity, which is also, you know, could be known as accuracy. So reliability measures how reproducible the finding is. So if I do the scale on someone and they get a score, and then I do this on the same patient, I do the scale again and I get a score, is that score the same or is it totally different? That's what reliability is. Is it actually hitting that same spot over and over? The testing, testing that thing that I'm trying to test a little bit. Not, not. I said that incorrectly last time. Is it hitting the same spot over and over? Um, and it's measured. We can, we can, we can put this into numbers from zero, no reliability to one, perfect reliability. So again, if if I take two PHQ nines back to back, does my patient score the same, or do they get a score of zero, and then the next time a minute later they get a score of 27? That would be a very unreliable test. There's actually a, a way we can break down reliability into the three different categories, and this is internal consistency, test retest reliability, and inner rater reliability. So really the type of reliability that I just talked about was test retest reliability, that you take a test and you get a score, and then you take another test and you get a score. Um, there's this other type, internal consistency, degree to which items on a scale test one dimension and not multiple dimensions. So if I take a generalized anxiety inventory, am I actually testing for generalized anxiety? Or am I testing for like stress? Or am I testing for PTSD? Or am I testing for depression? Um, so am I really testing for generalized anxiety? Or am I testing for irritability or something else, right? So is it actually testing that? Inner, inner, um, 
um, inner rater reliability. Uh, the clinic, these are clinician-based scales. It's essentially the test retest reliability, but but when I do the scale, um, so you know you have two scales that you can do. You you give the patient a scale, they fill it out. That would be test retest reliability. Inner rater reliability is, I'm a clinician. I say this patient scores this high score on depression. They see another clinician. That clinician says, Oh look, we have the same score because that scale is being scored the same way. Um, it's measured by Kappa with an excellent score of better than 0.7. So really the reason why I put this in here is to show you a little bit of the science behind it, that there actually is a science to this, that, that this reliability can be kind of on a spectrum, and that there's a certain arbitrary cutoff that we've set in, in medicine to say this passes that cutoff. Validity or accuracy is, is the other type. Um, validity is, is, in general, a lot more complicated than reliability. So if you were lost before, I apologize, because it's, it's only going to get worse. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you just know, just remember this at the end of the day, right? There's, there's accurate and precise. You're hitting the target over and over and over, and you're hitting in the right place. There's not accurate, and there's precise. So this would be um, reliable, the term that we're using. Look, it's reliable. It's hitting the same spot over and over and over again, but it's not hitting the target. This is um, valid or accurate, but um, not precise or not reliable. So you're hitting near the bullseye, but you're really not hitting the same point over and over again. And this is just, we all know what this is. It's not a good scale. Don't ever use it. Um, so what is validity measure? It measures the degree of correspondence between an item on the test and what is actually attempting to measure. So there's some fuzziness here, I think even in my mind. So how is this different from internal uh, consistency? Well, so let's see, this degree into which an item on a scale tests one dimension and not multiple dimensions. Okay, so, so maybe, maybe a better way to say this is like on the PHQ-9, um, one of the questions is, you know, how often have you thought of, let's say, suicide? So that question is really just asking about suicide. It's not asking about sleep. It's not asking about appetite. It's not asking so. So it's really getting to that specific question. And with validity, we're now talking about kind of the whole construct. So I kind of misspoke earlier. Validity is more about that whole construct and, and, and not really. Um, psychiatry has a big problem with validity, which, which we kind of will talk about in a second. Because, well, we can talk about it now. There's, there's no really gold standard diagnosis, right? So. So in, in, let's say, the rest of medicine, and not, not, not really necessarily across medicine, there are other branches of medicine that, that struggle with the same thing. Um, uh, but like, let's say, for example, what is pneumonia? Well, pneumonia is I put a stethoscope up to someone, I hear coarse sounds, and then I do an x-ray, and the x-ray shows patchy infiltrates, right? We don't have anything like this in psychiatry. So in, in psychiatry, I, I, I don't use a stethoscope. I don't do chest x-rays, brain scans don't really have any, any value. So like the, the question, what is pneumonia, is an easier question to answer. Still difficult, but an easier question to, you know, I can culture someone's lungs, I can see the bacteria even. That's an easier question to answer than what is depression. And so really, um, really the question is, is what is depression? Am I actually measuring what depression is? Is a difficult question to answer. And what we're just going to leave it at now, and we could talk for a long time about that, um, but what we're going to leave it at now is, you know, let's just trust the DSM. Let's just trust that, that that's the gold standard or something like it, and, and we'll see if these scales compare to that. So that's kind of what we're trying to measure. There's three types of validity, of course, just to make it even more confusing. Um, the first is content validity. So uh, the scale covers the most important feature of the disorder. So if you have a generalized anxiety disorder scale, and you don't ask about worry, which is a core feature, it's a, one of the core features of anxiety, you're, you're not actually asking about anxiety, you're asking about something else. Criterion validity, you're comparing uh, a new scale to an old one. So let's say I have a Beck depression inventory, which is one of the first uh, scales ever invented for depression, and I have this new fancy scale called the PHQ-9. I give someone a PHQ-9, I give someone a Beck depression inventory, they should be scoring about the same, right? If they're, they both should be elevated, they both should be down, I shouldn't have a mismatch between those scales. Construct validity, um, comprehensive assessment of validity, it covers a full range of disorder, not just a part of it. Um, test can be applied anywhere, and the test can be applied to anyone. So 
does does this scale apply to only a certain amount of people or does it apply to all people does it apply to just part of depression like maybe there's a certain subset of depression of people that just don't get out of bed does it apply to them does it also apply to the people that stay awake all night does it apply to those depressed people as well does it apply to the depressed people that, that have di you know diabetes does it apply to the depressed people that have um, a cancer diagnosis right so that's that's really what construct validity is getting at it's kind of a core core validity component okay so we did it remember these targets that's validity that's accuracy um, these have numbers behind it that's all I wanted to go over uh, next is sensitivity and specificity um, so we kind of all are aware of this now with actually the coronavirus so if I have a COVID test, does a positive COVID test mean I actually have COVID? Does a negative COVID test mean I actually don't have COVID? That's really the question with sensitivity and specificity. With sensitivity, uh, basically you're trying to not miss any people that actually have COVID. And with specificity, you're trying to um, eliminate all people that actually don't have COVID. So it, with these two things combined, then I get the correct population, right? Because with sensitivity, if I'm pooling everyone that has COVID with some people that don't, that's sensitivity. And then with specificity, if I eliminate all of the people that then uh, don't actually have COVID, then I'm left with just the COVID population. And so that's why these two principles are powerful together. You can just read this slide now. Sensitivity is the likelihood that a positive test means you have the condition. So let's say on a depression screen, if, if, if the sensitivity is 0.8, then the test will catch 8 out of 10 patients with depression, and it'll miss 2 patients. Um, accurate sensitivity is important when a disease prevalence is low. right? So if let's say I only have 2 patients that are depressed in the whole world, I, I I could actually, you know, be missing those two patients with a, I need a really high sensitivity because I don't want to miss those patients, right? Um, I really, really want to make sure they're included. Um, scales are also sometimes able to measure change in disease measured by effect size. So this also has an effect size kind of attached to its sensitivity. So just as another concept, that's a bell and whistle. You don't have to know that as much. Um, I think that's all I want to say right now for sensitivity. Um, this is a screen, and you're just trying to catch as many people. Now, you know, I guess what I could also say is that we have to decide then as clinicians what's an appropriate sensitivity measure. So let's say the screen was not just depression, let's say it was a screen for suicide attempts, which we don't have, right? We don't have really any way of measuring whether someone's gonna commit suicide or not. Would I want to try to catch 100% of people that are gonna commit suicide? Um, or would I not? And we'll talk about this more in a second, but that's kind of what's going on with sensitivity and setting this value. Or, you know, and, and the problem is, is in catching 100% of the people that have the suicidality, I'm also going to be catching the people that don't. And then those all get lumped together. And then the question is, what do I do with those people? Um, and that's another question kind of for the whole system to, to, to ask. The next concept is specificity. This is the likelihood that a negative test means you don't have the condition. I took a COVID test. It was negative. I don't have COVID. I really don't have COVID because the specificity of that test is good. And every test will have a different, excuse me, a different specificity. Um, it's the same, uh, it's, it's accurate when the disease prevalence is high. Uh, here's another way to conceptualize. So the problem is, is I can't get a perfectly sensitive and a perfectly specific test. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. I wish it did. Uh, there's always kind of a trade-off between these things. So let's take blood pressure as an example. Here's a blood pressure of 140. That is what we've decided in medicine that is hypertensive. So anyone above 140 has high blood pressure. Anyone less than 140 
doesn't have high blood pressure. But you can see that some people have a blood pressure lower than 140, but they're actually diseased. Their, their blood vessels are actually being damaged by their blood pressure, even though we say they don't. And you can also see that there are some people that have blood pressure higher than 140, and their blood vessels are not being damaged um, by that high blood pressure. What this is doing then is by setting an arbitrary value of 140, we're saying, you know what, I want to, it's okay if I miss these diseased people. Their blood vessels are being damaged, but I'm okay with that. Um, that's basically what you're saying. And it's okay if I put these healthy people in a disease category, even though they're healthy. I'm going to treat them. I'm going to give them meds. And the side effects of the medicines is okay. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, and this is true basically for any test. And this is the problem is test, a test will never give us these true populations. There's always going to be some kind of give and take. And you can see that if I move this over here, I'm now catching all the diseased. My specificity gets better, but my sensitivity gets worse. If I move this to the left, I'm now, um, I'm now catching 100% of people that are diseased. So my sensitivity gets better, but my specificity gets, gets worse. Let me say that again. If I move this bar to the right, my specificity gets better because all my um, faults, um, let me see, all my, let me think about this for a second. Uh, I think that's right. Don't quote me on this. Don't quote me on this. I think that's right. So, um, yeah, you have more diseased people. There's less. But you can see how it's going to change. Um, how does this blood pressure example apply to psychiatry? Here's a wonderful chart from up to date. The, the reference will be at the, at the end. Uh, this shows the sensitivity and specificity of the screening questions for uh, the pH. Q and for some of our common depression screenings in a primary care setting. So this is a primary care setting. This isn't going to be our setting. Ours is going to be a little different, um, but we can in general use these values. So if I ask you two questions from the PHQ-9, are you depressed? This is the first two questions. Have you, have you lost interest in things? That is a sensitivity of 97%. Amazing. So now it's, it's scored positively. I'll now go on to the rest of the PHQ-9. Notice as I continue to ask questions, my sensitivity goes down. That's OK, because the first two questions, it was 97%, so I've already caught almost everyone. But now, since I'm asking more questions, my specificity is increasing. So you can really see this. And now I'm actually capturing the people that are truly depressed, and I'm eliminating people that fell into that positive screen. Oh, look, it, they screen positive for depression, but they actually don't have depression. Um, you can do this for any other scale. Here's a Cornell scale um, for depression and dementia. And here's a, um, another depression scale and a geriatric depression scale. Notice that the geriatric depression scale has um, uh, lower sensitivity and, and, uh, uh, than the PHQ-9. So it's kind of interesting. It's like, do you screen geriatric patients with the PHQ-9? Do you screen them with this depression scale? And, uh, 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 you know, or do you do a PHQ-2, excuse me, a PHQ-2, and then do the GRT scale for confirm confirmation? It gets kind of nuanced and kind of interesting, actually, I think. At least interesting to me. Positive predictive value and negative predictive value. These are very important terms, probably the most important. Positive predictive value is the odds that you have the disease if you screen positive. Negative predictive value is the odds that you don't have the disease if you screen negative. So actually, that's kind of what I was doing here. I was changing sensitivity and specificity, but what I was kind of doing too was changing the positive predictive value, and that's actually what I was talking about. As this goes over here, everyone will have the disease prior, so the positive predictive value it increases. Um, of the test. Now there are still people that are diseased that, that haven't screened positive, but that's, we'll just miss those. That's kind of what happens. Um, negative predictive value odds that you don't have the disease if you screen negative. Um, again, a, you would want that, um, let's say here, right, would give me a perfect negative predictive value because if I screen negative, everyone's healthy. But I am missing people that, um, of course, I mean, I absolutely know for certain you're healthy, I don't necessarily know if you have disease or not. 
So that's kind of actually what I was talking about in that. And, and, and these are positive predictive value, negative predictive value, sensitivity, and specificity. Those all kind of run together. Um, and positive predictive value goes up as prevalence goes up, um, uh, similar to um, specificity. So specificity and sensitivity and negative predictive value are kind of similar in that way. Um, just to make it even more confusing, we have these ways of calculating the um, uh, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. I'm becoming tired at this point. Um, we only have one slide to go. You're, you're doing great. Keep it up. Um, so we have this last slide. Just bear with me. Radical focus. You've almost finished this. So for sensitivity, what is sensitivity? It's the true positive over the true positive plus the false negative. So it's the true positive over the true positive plus the false negative. So let's say a true positive is someone that the test said was positive and that actually has the disease. A false negative is someone that the test says is negative, but they actually have the disease. So basically, you're just looking at diseased people, right? And you're saying, did the test get them or did the test not get them? And you're taking, oh, the test did get them, and you're putting that over people that, that, that took the test and the test said was negative, but they actually have the disease. So it's kind of just looking at the disease and trying to capture as much of that disease as possible, right? That's the concept. Specificity, you now go in this direction. It's the true negative over the true negative plus the false positive. So the true negative is someone, I do the test, it says it's negative, I don't have COVID. Oof. I really don't have COVID because it's a true negative. It is um, over a false positive, so the test says you do have COVID, but I actually don't have COVID. So what I'm trying to do in this category of specificity is I'm trying to collect all of the people that don't have the disease, and I'm trying to see how well I'm doing that. Here's a person that doesn't have the disease. I put that over the people that I say have the disease, but actually don't have it, um, over the people that also you know, um, don't have the disease clear as mud. All right, here's positive predictive value. We have true positive. It goes in this direction now. So sensitivity goes in this direction. Specificity goes in this direction. Positive predictive value goes in this direction. And then negative predictive value goes in this direction. So positive predictive value, I take the true positive. I put it over the true positive over the false positive, And then I get this. So this is all the positive people. Um, they actually have COVID. I put them over the people with COVID plus the people that I said had COVID but actually don't have COVID. And that's how good my test will be at actually finding um, uh, people that, how good is a positive test? Is it, do I actually have COVID if I have a positive test or not? Um, and negative predictive value is gonna be the opposite, true negative over false negative over true negative. All right, we did it. So in conclusion, this is all I really want you to know on the highest level. Just because a scale exists doesn't mean it's good. There's actually like data that goes into this. There's a lot of science that goes into this. We have quantitative methods for determining if the scales are precise and accurate, if I'm actually hitting the target. Be wary of studies that emphasize secondary findings using scales other than gold standard. So the scales that we've gone over are validated scales. They're good. If, they're, if you're reading a paper and you're like, what in the heck is this? I've never seen a scale before. I'd be kind of worried about that study. Uh, review gold standard scales on your own. So this is a great way to figure out, because these scales, what they're trying to do is they're trying to find the core of depression, right? They're trying to find the core of anxiety. So if you know the scale, hopefully you're getting more and more touch and, and with this nebulous concept, what is depression, what is anxiety? Scales define remission and response. So like, for example, on the PHQ-9, remission is um, a decrease in 50%. So if I start with, let's say, a PHQ-9 of 18, and I, I go down to, let's say, a 9, probably an 8, that's definitely, um, excuse me, that's definitely a response, is a 50% decrease. Remission is the absence of symptoms, which on the PHQ-9 I think is defined as like 5 or less than 5. Um, so that means remission, your, your, your disease is now totally controlled. Response means I have a 50% decrease. In general, it, it varies depending on the scale. And in psychiatry, scales measure an abstract disease that itself is ill-defined. So I'm like trying to peg this DSM that's trying to peg something else. So it, it really is a difficult process. Um, 
you can now take a break if you want. We're going to be talking about statistics in, in the next um, lecture, and that is going to be a bear, so if you need a little break, feel free to take it.